Hello and welcome to the debate. I'm your host, Sana Makbul, with you at B2B World. In today's show, we will be taking a look at two very important stories. Uh, the first is in reference to another uh, interesting development that has taken place with the National Assembly Speaker accepting 35 more lawmakers uh, from uh, the uh, Pakistan that he can serve and their resignations in the National Assembly, bringing the grand total to 80. And then, of course, 81 if we also include the resignation accepted of the Awami Muslim League leader. Uh, these accepted resignations of the BTI come just about three days after the previous 34 resignations of the BTI lawmakers in the National Assembly were accepted by the Speaker. Of course, as uh, before, the BTI lawmakers have accused the Speaker of the ill intent uh, and talked about how this is against the Constitution, is also immoral, illegal, uh, and that this is not something that they want and they need fresh elections in the country, and also spoke about how the rest of the resignation should also be accepted, uh, ending this crisis once for all. Um, of of course, that hasn't happened so far and the government and the current political setup with the National Assembly Speaker has cited their own reasons behind the acceptance of resignations previously and now as well. But moving forward in terms of where we stand today, particularly at the center and then also in the provinces of KP and Punjab with, the, of course, the elections in uh, both the provinces with the assemblies dissolved, is a situation of a huge political concern for Pakistan and also given the fact that there are numerous economic challenges facing the country um, with foreign reserves and all time low and the talks with the IMF still pending. We'll talk more about that in the next segment, but our first one is going to focus on the political situation, the acceptance of these resignations and what that means in the National Assembly and how things are going to proceed with PTI and the rest of the political parties. In our next segment, we'll take a look at uh, the decision taken by the government with regards to having tough conversations with the IMF program regarding a number of issues that still remain. They've also invited the IMF mission to visit uh, Pakistan in the next week um, to figure out and finalize uh, a lot of the issues that still remain. In the past week alone, we saw that a number of internal meetings uh, were taken place uh, with the Prime Minister also heading at least two of them and uh, talking about how we're going to proceed forward. Of course, the government has been trying to balance the IMF program and also providing relief to the masses. And unfortunately, both seem to be in contradiction at the moment, which is why the government has had to make very tough measures. But what we're going to do in terms of moving forward mm -hmm. seems to be pointing towards a direction where perhaps the IMF program uh, will be accepted accepted in its full form. Right now, of course, the government is still planning negotiations and no particular decision is final, but they will be uh, producing a plan in order to provide the kind of corrective measures that the IMF has been seeking. Whether or not we'll see the visit before or after this still remains to be seen and how much this is going to impact the daily life uh, prices and of course the economy uh, is also a huge concern for Pakistan. But uh, what that means also for the way that we're going to proceed in the remaining fiscal year and how we're going to interact with other financial financial institutions such as the World Bank and other countries which all want to go ahead under the IMF umbrella. So that is going to be our focus in the next segment of the show today. For this and more, as always, in the studios, I've been joined by senior analyst Farooq Mustafi. And for our first segment regarding the political situation, we've also been joined by Dr. Shizra Mansab Kharal, leader PMLN. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Shizra, for joining us and being a part of the debate. Farooq, considering, of course, that this particular <laughs> development has come just two or three days after uh, the announcement made by the National Assembly Speaker regarding the acceptance of 34 resignations uh, of the BTI members and now 35 more. And if we're counting the uh, 11 uh, resignations accepted previously as well, it brings the total to 80. Uh, it was this something that we've talked about before when the first announcement came that we're going maybe going to be seeing in terms of the acceptance of resignations. And does this point towards the fact that maybe uh, more and more resignations will be accepted and the, the BTI's demand of all resignations to be accepted will be fulfilled? Uh, right, uh, Sana, I think uh, that that can happen. Uh, uh, but uh, here's the thing. Uh, since, uh, uh, you know, first 35 resignations were accepted, at that time we heard something very interesting. Uh, the uh, Pakistani media somehow was outraged and everybody started saying that this is uh, unfair. Now, one of the anchors or analysts, I don't know, I haven't been able to place him somewhere, uh, but he even tweeted today uh, calling for, uh, uh, for the attention of the Chief Justice of Pakistan saying that the Constitution is being violated somehow. Mm. Uh, amazingly, if I have resigned, right, mm. onus is on me. If you accept or not accept, onus is not on you, right? 
So this is something that people don't seem to understand because I think that somehow our media does not, uh, you know, care much about uh, the parliament. It doesn't uh, care much about the institutions. And there are some, some uh, anchors, uh, uh, frankly, at the start, because uh, the moment it happened, they were taken on air and they started commenting and they unfortunately t uh, took a very aggressive stance. And now they seem to be actually stuck with it, despite the fact that they are actually democratic minded. And there are people who actually believe that this whole thing, uh, uh, you know, uh, or the idea of uh, bringing, uh, you know, preponing an election is unfair one. So at this moment, uh, this is happening. Uh, I understand that it is prerogative of the Speaker National Assembly to accept our resignation whenever he is satisfied. Uh, whether he is satisfied or not is up to him to judge, not the media. But that continues because this is who we have become. We uh, actually launder outrage. We keep on selling and we keep on, uh, you know, uh, spreading or peddling anger and anguish. And this actually reminds me of similar attitude towards Obama administration. Mm. Uh, the uh, American media also actually lo lost its handle. And once it did, uh, you know, uh, Donald Trump became uh, inevitable and then he came to power and then the very same media was continuously triggered because Donald T Trump knew how to press all the buttons. Hmm. These are the people who have been victims of, uh, you know, uh, the previous government and yet they keep on doing this. I don't understand. But regarding PTI, amazingly, PTI leaders also today walked to the parliament and once again they said that this is very unfair. Mm. I don't understand what part of it is unfair. If you resign and you haven't been able to show up in the parliament and you have been drawing your perks and privileges, some of the ministers, ex-ministers have not even vacated their premises, their official residences, if someday uh, your designation is accepted, you cannot actually complain. Uh, even though mo most of the people who have been actually, uh, uh, whose designations have been accepted are my friends, personal friends. Hmm. But even then, frankly, you should have thought about this consequence before tendering the designation and must. Right, absolutely. Dr. Shazra, considering, of course, uh, that when we take a look at the situation and what Farooq has been uh, pointing to us is the fact that once the resignations were submitted, it means that the uh, party leaders or lawmakers actually want those resignations to be accepted. What seems to be the problem now, because there was a lot of hue and cry uh, in the past with, with the rest of the party resignations not being accepted, why is this an issue today for the PTI once their resignations are being accepted? And Dr. Shazra, could you also explain why is it that you have decided to accept the resignations piecemeal rather than uh, holistically or collectively? On the show, um, I think that this is the speaker's prerogative, and he's within his rights, which is uh, which is granted to him through the constitution, to accept the resignations. Despite the fact he has been asking again and again, repeatedly asking the PTI to come and come to him one by one and uh, tell them, tell him that he uh, they, that they want to. On the other hand, what's actually been happening is that people have been contacting him saying that they do not want to hand in the resignations. And there's a um, an example, right? I think somebody today even uh, uh, sent him a letter, the speaker, saying that they don't want to tender the resignations, which is why the speaker was hesitant to accept all the resignations. Even in the last um, uh, a few months, somebody went to the court to say, somebody from Karachi went to the court to say that they did not want to hand in the resignations, which is why the speaker was very, very careful. And despite having invited the PTI again and again to come to the parliament, to come and give their input, come and sit there as, an, as the opposition, the PTI did not come to the parliament. And despite the fact that the speaker repeatedly asked them to come and tell him one by one, they did not. They went in groups and on TV and on media and on social media, they kept on repeating that they want their resignations to be accepted. So I think the speaker is quite within his rights to accept the resignations. And it is his prerogative 
to accept them as and when he feels that it is the right time to do it. All right, absolutely. And and that may be so, but considering what the PTI is talking about, of course, uh, they are linking this to the statements that have been made by the PTI chairman and other PTI leaders with regards to their plans to return to the National Assembly uh, or to move a no trust motion against the Prime Minister. Um, and, and so we didn't see the resignations in, in a long span of time prior to this. And within a week, we've seen two major announcements coming in. Um, is that is that something that can be linked and is is something that the PTI can uh, at least talk about in terms of uh, accusing the speaker of ill intent and talking about the timings? Could this perhaps have been done earlier in order to avoid all of that? Well, the PTI, I think, uh, is living in the past, in the 2014, when they gave their resignations and then they spent three years getting all the perks, all the privileges, getting their pay, everything and did not come to the assembly, they have always not given the parliament the supremacy that it deserves. And now, again, I think the thought that the same thing will be repeated, but history sometimes does not repeat itself. And according to what is happening right now and seeing what Imran Khan has been doing in the past few months, if we look back at history, what he wants, what he wants after his ouster on the 9th of April, which was done according to the Constitution, rather than following the Constitution and sitting in the Assembly as the opposition, they decided to go on the roads. And they decided to do this long march, which was an abysmal failure. People did not come out for him. People did not follow him. And from that day onwards, Imran Khan has been wanting to pressurize the government to hold the elections, but elections are held according to the Constitution, not according to the whim of a person who decides that if he is in the government, everything is fine. If he's not in the government, then everything can just be disrupted. And he's trying to destabilize the government. He's trying to destabilize the state. He does not care what the government is facing. And by the way, I would just like to um, point out draw your attention to his recent speech, I think it was today, when he said that the the IMF has some very strict um, rule, uh, uh, things that we, we, we will need to follow. He is the one and his government is the one who signed this IMF deal. And yes, there are some very tough decisions that the government will have to take. But what did his government do? When he was ousted constitutionally, he took, uh, he just, you know, rescinded on his um, uh, responsibilities and he just broke the IMF uh, agreement and just left. That's what his government did. And as far as, as the, the uh, economic conditions are concerned of the country right now, I don't think the government or the, the country can at this moment have these elections just because one person feels that he is, has to be either in the government or elections have to be. What is his uh, right. logic for elections? Right. He has no logic. The only reason that he wants to hold elections is to be in the government. There is no other logic that he can present. What will elections achieve? That is the question. What will early elections achieve apart from just wasting the resources of the state, the resources of the gov uh, of the people of the uh, country who trusted these people, when people vote for, P uh, for PTI or any other uh, person to come to the assembly, they vote for them to come sit in the assembly and be their voice. They don't vote so that they can just go away and just go to the roads and start their long marches or their whatever they want and not actually be the voice of the people who have voted for them. Right, absolutely. Um, and we'll talk more about that as well. But Farooq, considering, of course, that when we take a look at the situation and the way that uh, the the moves or, or decisions by different political parties have been affecting the country, mm. um, it's important, of course, uh, to have accountability. But in terms of what uh, we, we've seen and what uh, Dr. Shizra was pointing out, there is a lot that uh, we can talk about with regards to the impact that has had regarding Imran Khan's decisions or the PTI's decisions. Uh, but in terms of where we uh, see what's happening at the center, 
know with, with the National Assembly Speaker, whether or not, of course, that it is prerogative. But do you think that the decisions that are happening now or the developments even just within this week are in any way facilitating towards stability? Um, uh, Sena, that is a good question. But uh, in order to answer that, uh, you'll have to first understand um, uh, why uh, the ruling coalition might have moved on uh, and uh, gone further to actually implement or accept designations. And that is, uh, uh, you know, what was the intent of Imran Khan's uh, uh, party to come back to the parliament? Was it to actually become part of the parliament and, uh, uh, you know, hold the government accountable? or whether it was to bring the system down. Uh, they have already shown you that their own chief ministers were repeatedly asking Imran Khan Saab not to go ahead with dissolution of governments because that was an advantage. And, but Imran Khan Saab says he has the scorched earth policy that if I'm not part of the system, then nobody can have their right to be part of it, right? Uh, so uh, what was the intent? The uh, exact intent as it was stated, and if you remember, we discussed it even before that, uh, before uh, the resignations were accepted, was that they are going to go back to the parliament and they will do some hocus pocus and try to bring the parliament down because then they can have elections, right? Uh, I totally get government's perspective regarding this, and I think that uh, in this circumstance, uh, these circumstances, stability is important. Uh, parliament plays an important role in stabilizing the country, and so does a government which is in power and fully empowered. But uh, the p question then is, uh, why is it that we don't hear that much about government's response regarding this? We haven't heard this defense coming on television every day. What we kept on hearing was either, either PTI, which is very articulate and knows how to actually sell its goods, or then the anchors, most of whom don't even appreciate uh, democracy or various tenets of democracy. You want to stabilize economy, Sana, you want to stabilize the country, uh, but then you have to actually hold, um, uh, you know, stick to uh, a given set of principles or rules. Uh, during General Parvez Musharraf's time, it was decided that every parliament of Pakistan will complete its term. Still then, it has been doing exactly that. And because of that, we, are, we were saved from the kind of uh, clown show that was there in 90s. Every two years, three years, assemblies would be dissolved. So this time, if somebody actually just wants to bring down the assembly, yes. can, I, can I actually regard their wishes at, as the gospel truth and nothing else? Right. Um, with regards to, of course, uh, the, the, the way forward, uh, Dr. Shazra, there is also uh, the way that we're going to be looking at uh, the assemblies in KP and uh, Punjab being dissolved and then the aftermath of that, uh, the elections uh, that, of course, are now going to be held. Um, considering the, the, the situation at the center and then in these two provinces and then the economic factors as well, um, can we see any possibility in terms of having any conversation or dialogue with the PTI or possibly uh, have uh, uh, elections with regards to uh, KP and Punjab being an affair which is at least civil, which is not something uh, in terms of the uh, raised political tensions uh, that we might be able to see in both these provinces? Um, I agree with Dr. Saab when he says that, uh, you know, it's the intent of the PTI that needs to be looked at. Uh, PTI has behaved in a very immature manner, I'm sorry to say, when they were in the parliament and when they left the parliament. When, the, when they were in the parliament, when the 2018 assembly started, both the, all the other uh, parties, despite the fact that they were not very happy about the way that the 2018 elections had been still decided to continue the democratic process. They came to the assembly after that, Imran Khan refused to shake hands with the opposition leaders. He refused to sit with the, all the opposition parties, even when there were very important things to be discussed. For example, COVID, or for example, the, the Kashmir issue when it happened, he refused to sit with the parties and thresh out different important issues of the for the state of the Pakistan. And then 
after he was ousted, he has again behaved in the same manner rather than sitting in the assembly and, and being, a, being a good opposition leader. And then he could have achieved a lot by sitting in the assembly. He decided to go on the road and repeat his performance of the 2014. Now, as far as the KP and the Punjab assemblies are concerned, he has, uh, despite the fact that most of the MPAs and the chief ministers did not want to uh, dissolve the assemblies. He has forced them to dissolve the assemblies and then come to this place now where this question of the caretaker government is now, uh, you know, a question that everybody will have to resolve. Now, the uh, as far as the, uh, the Punjab assembly is concerned, they could not come to any consensus about the caretaker government. Now it's with the election commission. And uh, the previous uh, chief minister has said that he will not accept what the election commissioner, who, again, this is written in the constitution of the Pakistan, that this is what the process will continue, uh, will, this is how it will happen. They decided the governor and the chief minister could not come to a uh, come to consensus. There was a committee they couldn't, and now the election commissioner has decided. But they've already said they're not going to accept without even knowing what's going to happen. So the, the, the point that I'm making is that if one party decides that the only thing that they want is disruption and destabilization of the country, what can you expect from all the other parties? The, all the other parties right. are behaving in a poor manner. Uh, right. I, I understand uh, that, Dr. Shazra, but um, I have two questions with this regard. One, why didn't we see any accountability or consequence then, especially since last year till now, uh, even uh, when we heard uh, the top political leadership, including the Prime Minister, stating the fact that uh, uh, the PTI chairman is the cause of a lot of problems in the country. And secondly, with regards to the assemblies in KP and Punjab, um, do you expect that there can be any possible delay, especially in terms of uh, the fact that uh, there is a lot of money that is going to go into this, there's a lot of planning and uh, the general elections are also around the corner. Can we perhaps see any objections being raised coming in from the ECP or otherwise uh, with regards to these elections or that we might see them being delayed and not happen in the 90 days? Um, as far as uh, Imran Khan is concerned, the rule of law will take its uh, you know, process. That's a process that will happen. And uh, the, the the other parties, the PDM or Pakistan Muslim League Moon, has nothing to do with this. It's the it's a process. He has uh, there's there's a lot of uh, you know uh, court cases against Imran Khan. The law will take its course and let's see how that turns out. We as a party do not believe in uh, what Imran Khan has been doing in using the different, uh, like the NAB or other, um, uh, you know, other means of just uh, getting the, uh, the, uh, the, the opposition into jails and all of that. We don't believe in that. So we're not going to do that. The law will take its course. As far as the, uh, the elections are concerned, there are already questions of whether these elections can happen earlier, the, the Punjab and the KP Assembly. One very important thing is the census, which was decided upon by the C, uh, CCI in, uh, in, I think, 2021, perhaps, that there, would, uh, there will be a new census before elections can happen. The second thing is just there is so much money involved so much so many state resources involved that and, and each and every individual mpa or mna who contests the election has to spend uh, so much money so just to satisfy the ego of one person or the whim of one person who thinks that just you know having elections three months or two months before and not waiting for the two or three months when the election is already going to happen. The election year has already started. So I think definitely there will be a, a problem. There will be the census problem. Sindh was not satisfied with the previous um, uh, census. And it was decided that a, a new census would happen before the 2023 right. election. Right. Uh, Dr. Seba, regarding census, uh, I understand that constitution actually stipulates the time uh, that uh, that needs to be there before next election can take place. And there are caveats, there are contingency plans. 
but there doesn't seem to be any matter regarding census or delimitation the way the government or uh, government's uh, uh, supporters keep on uh, citing uh, can you explain to us uh, how you are going to address the matter of constitution not seeing this issue the way you are actually looking at it uh, they, the process of the census has already started. I don't know. I don't know the exact amount of money, but uh, you know there was a, a certain amount laid aside already for the census to start. And uh, one of the, you know, being a federation, we have to see how all the different provinces look at these things. And Sindh was the province uh, which uh, who did not, uh, you know, agree to the previous census. So. How these things will pan out, it's still early days to say. I'm not saying that everything is decided or that everything has been worked out. But uh, all these things will have to be taken into consideration before uh, any dates can be announced for the uh, upcoming elections in the no, no, provinces. Uh, uh, I, I understand that. My concern is that, uh, you know, the gum, uh, you know, constitution does not, uh, does not give the central government or federal government any authority to amend this 90-day uh, rule. Uh, will you go to a Supreme Court or somewhere else uh, to see the kind of uh, concession that you want? Um, we, uh, you know, the party leaders have not decided that as yet, and I, I can't really say this at this point. These are things that are still under consideration and uh, will be decided by the party leaders. But the, the only thing that I would like to point out is that, you know, the whim of one person who has gone to this length. And if you uh, if you listen to his speech that he gave today, Imran Khan, where he talks about the IMF, which is a deal that he made, which he talks about the economy, which is what his four, almost four years government brought us to. And today he even said that there is one person who brought about regime change and which has resulted in the in this government. Now, please, I would like to remind the public that initially Imran Khan said that it was America who brought about the regime change. <laughs> yeah, now he, he has back on that, and now it has become this one mysterious person who brought about the regime change. So a person who can just go back and take all these U-turns, Pakistan, yeah. the public of Pakistan will really have to see how seriously we can take him and how far his actions should really determine the course of the future of Pakistan. Right, absolutely. And we really hope that our people are able to deconstruct people and their statements and the underlying meanings like that, especially our political leaders. But uh, Dr. Shazra, one final question on the political situation before we ask a couple of uh, economy-related questions as well, especially the IMF program that you've been pointing out. Um, with regards to the uh, acceptance of resignations at the National Assembly, of course, the PTI now is demanding acceptance of all the rest of the resignations. Considering that we saw this move within uh, three days of the previous announcement of 34 uh, resignations being accepted, do you expect, in your opinion, that we can see potentially in the coming days acceptance of all resignations? Well, the question I think should be who gave the resignations Who's, and who has been insisting on the resignations being accepted? Uh, and what is the outcome of those resignations? You see, uh, Imran Khan, first of all, there were seven or eight uh, seats uh, which were uh, uh, where the resignations were accepted and he decided to make the state and uh, contest elections on all of these. Then 35 more were accepted. He said, I'm going to contest on all the 35 seats. Now 35 more have been accepted. So where is this leading us? Where is this okay. charade that Imran Khan has started it leading us? Will he end up then contesting on all the PTI seats that he did? And where will that lead us? That is the question that should be asked. And those are the important things that the public and the and the uh, and the Pakistani people should be thinking of. Of what is Imran Khan trying to achieve with all these resignations? It's right. been almost four, five months that the the government, the PDM, has been inviting and asking, and the speaker has been asking the PTI to come and either tell that they want to give the resignations or refuse to give the resignations. And just one more point. When the PTI decided that they wanted to come back to the uh, assembly, the first thing that they should have done, rather than going on social media or other uh, media, 
to come to the speaker and say that we want to take back our resignations that right. was the way of doing it Right, absolutely. Um, okay, Dr. Shildra, considering, of course, that we've been hearing reports coming in uh, with regards to the government's plan to move ahead with the IMF program and be able to have discussions on the very important <coughs> issues, uh, especially perhaps the outline conditions that uh, we still haven't really agreed upon. Um, there is, of course, especially a lot of issues coming in as to where we stand in terms of the finance ministry as well and with the IMF program uh, being laid out. And, and currently, of course, the foreign reserves are extremely low and our economic conditions and our engagements with other bilateral engagements and institutions depends on this as well. And so if IMF program is a priority, will we be seeing an acceptance of all uh, the conditions? Um, and will the visit of the IMF, especially which is called or expected to be seen within the next week, be done before or after any corrective measures are taken by the government? Well, the government has decided uh, uh, that was the, the, the main point of taking up the government at this uh, juncture when uh, the PDM and all the parties knew where uh, Imran Khan and his government had brought Pakistan. So the the point was to take these tough decisions and to try and save the country that is of the utmost importance. And the IMF program is uh, it's inevitable. We will have to uh, even though the tough decisions and the tough uh, you know, everything was decided by the PTI government, but the government has come to the conclusion that these things will have to be, you know, adhered to and these things will have to be followed, although the government has uh, is trying to put the minimum pressure on the, you know, lesser privileged people. And right. And Dr. Shazra, is the, is the finance ministry aligned with these decisions? Uh, yes, it's uh, every everybody's aligned with these decisions okay. and that is what is going to happen. And we're going to try and take these tough decisions because that is the only way forward. Otherwise, as you've just pointed out, all the other countries, the friendly countries and everything, the aid that they will give us or the support that they will give us is also dependent upon this. So the IMF conditions will have to be followed, only trying to put the least pressure on the lesser privileged people of Pakistan. Right, but that also means a uh, high political cost for the current political setup as well and with the way that we've seen the narrative coming in from the PTI and of course with the elections really close this year as well, uh, will that sort of a political pressure also be uh, able to be handled by the PMLN and other parties? Well, I think the, uh, the people of Pakistan are seeing and then they know what is happening, they know what the uh, the four-year tenure of uh, 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 the PTI government brought us to. There were so many uh, uh, finance ministers, four or five were changed. The first year was wasted by now going to the IMF. So many finance secret secretaries were changed. So it was a complete chaos. And uh, uh, the in Punjab even, Usman Buzdar, the chief minister, himself stated that I am going to learn everything on on the job, I'm, I'm doing learning on the job. And even Imran Khan himself said that we had no idea of how to handle the government. So we're going to just learn. So all of those things are there. The people know what happened, how we came to, to be in this condition that we are in and that the PDM parties together decided to take up this challenge for the state of Pakistan to save the economy of Pakistan. And I think that we will be able to do this and the people, uh, the public will, inshallah, when the general elections happen, happen, they will give their vote and they will be the ones to decide uh, who was working for Pakistan and who was working on some other foreign agenda against Pakistan. Right. We've also been joined by senior analyst uh, Metam Heather and uh, by telephone line, and we'll be discussing the financial situation, especially with regards to the IMF program with him as well. Dr. Shildra, stay with us. Uh, with regards to this uh, particular decisions by the government with the IMF program, of course, we can understand the inevitability of this and the fact that uh, Pakistan uh, needs to go ahead uh, with the IMF program. But in the way that we would have liked to uh, see the kind of balance that the government has been trying as well uh, in the previous year or so, uh, in terms of the amount, uh, the, the amount of the cost that will be borne by the general public and the, uh, the, how the measures are going to impact them. And then, of course, the way that Pakistan's economy is going to proceed further. How do you think that now the stance of going ahead with the conditions of the IMF is going to impact all of that and uh, whether or not we'll be able to strike any of that balance? 
Thank you very much. Actually, you know, the, the keeping in view the declining foreign exchange reserves, there was no other option but to seek the revival of the IMF program. And uh, yesterday uh, night, Prime Minister chaired a high-level meeting on the second consecutive day, and it was decided that the Pakistan would approach the IMF. And Pakistan uh, Secretary of Finance uh, emailed to the IMF uh, uh, mission chief, Mr. Nathan Porter, and uh, we are just waiting for their response. Uh, but you know, it's a very significant development because uh, there was a stalemate and deadlock uh, on the IMF front, and the government of Pakistan has decided that they will take the all required measures to revive the IMF program. And when the IMF program will be revived, it will help Pakistan to improve its dollar liquidity crunch, uh, due to which uh, you see the, uh, the very difficult situation has just occurred on the opening of the letter of credit for bringing imports and essential imports into Pakistan. So let's hope that the IMF program will be revived in the next few days. But it depends that how the government moves towards the prescription suggested by the IMF. So uh, the informal talks probably will begin from next week. And if both sides agreed on memorandum of economic and financial policy related document, then it will be con converted into the formal talks and the uh, staff level agreement will be struck. That right, will pave the way for... But, uh, the, but the negotiations that you're referring to, does this mean that we have any room of, of a conversation anymore? So let's hope for the best because... Right, there, Mr. Mithab, no can you hear me? On the economic front. Uh, Mr. Mithab, considering the, what you're talking about, the negotiations or the talks that to be held, does this mean that there's still perhaps room of uh, us putting forward a proposal different from what the IMF conditions are as of now? But actually, you know, uh, the IMF uh, in Pakistan have just identified the main areas on which both sides will hold the parlays. And that area is uh, including the fiscal consolidation, including taking additional taxation measures and uh, erasing the monster of the circular debt in both electricity and uh, gas sectors. And one of other major area of discussion will be the unified exchange rate. For, because, you know, at the moment there are multiple exchange rate and IMF wants one unified exchange rate because there is a, a there is a formal exchange rate and uh, uh, and in the car market there is a different rate. So uh, these are the major areas on which both sides will kick right. start. Right. All right. And I, I understand that. Um, Faro, considering that uh, we understand perhaps the important areas or conditions that are that are to be met, but in in terms of the fact that when we take a look at how inevitable they may they, they may be in terms of Pakistan. Uh, perhaps having this as the only option going forward. Uh, there is also the concern of how it's going to impact the common people and how much uh, uh, they're going to be suffering because of uh, the result of these measures taken. Is there a way to be able to uh, perhaps protect the, the very poor uh, and downtrodden in the society yeah. and then be able to maximize uh, uh, all of those conditions towards perhaps the elite? Uh, right, uh, Sana, I think this is a very good question and I, let me answer it very, uh, you know, in a holistic manner. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, <coughs> uh, government of Pakistan, thanks to BISP, has its uh, targeted subsidy process, right, uh, through which it, it can uh, transfer cash uh, to the most vulnerable. And because of that, we have seen that even during the time of COVID, the government was able to protect, uh, you know, the most vulnerable. That is the case now as well. Uh, immediately after floods, we saw cash transfers. And, uh, you know, most uh, uh, vulnerable got something uh, to take care of. Uh, having said that, uh, you know, uh, the biggest problem at this moment, everybody keeps on talking about cost of working with IMF, right? And that it is going to uh, increase inflation in the country. There, there are two scenarios, Sana. Mm -hmm. One, uh, where inflation is high, 
because of your cooperation, but it is temporary because after cooperation and after these strict measures, there will be some economic stability. And the other one is uh, not cooperating with IMF and then uh, the inflation that results. So uh, the pundits that I keep on listening to who actually claim that at this time uh, inflation is touching somewhere around 30 to 35 percent, mm -hmm. they keep on saying that there is a possibility that cooperating with IMF might take our inflationary burden to 40 per percent plus. But if you don't cooperate because you are continuously sinking in a quicksand, uh, the inflation can go to 60 percent. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, just consider this, uh, uh, it is not merely Pakistan, even in the US, if you talk about the cost of eggs, if you talk about cost of, uh, uh, you know, dairy products, they are touching the roof. Uh, Bangladesh, a country that has incredible amount of, uh, uh, you know, forex reserves, even they have gone to IMF and IMF uh, asked exactly the same thing uh, from them to increase the prices of fuel uh, and, uh, you know, electricity, and they have complied. Hmm. So we'll have to realize what we, are, we have been doing. Because of this possibility of consequences, the government keeps on giving Imran Khan some more leeway because then everybody keeps on saying that this government cannot stabilize because, uh, because it is worried about the election, and that's why you need elections so that Imran Khan or whosoever comes can stabilize the economy. Right. You know uh, it uh, as well as I do that even Imran Khan will not be able to handle this, right? Mm. So the picture at this moment is of, uh, you know, it reminds me of a film called um, uh, Austin Powers, Mike Myers movie, where the, a person stands before a bulldozer and he's shouting, right? Uh, atop his voice that he's going to be crushed. Then they cut to the long shot and there is a huge distance between the bulldozer and mm. the man, but because right. the man is shouting, eventually he's crushed by the bulldozer. Right. Let us hope that we don't actually go down that way. Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Shazra, very quickly, the, the BISP program that Farrakh was pointing out, of course, the concern is how to protect uh, the poor and the masses. Is that something in place if we're going to go ahead with the IMF conditions? Well, you know, uh, Isagdar Saab, who's the finance minister, has uh, gone through, uh, you know, previously also, there were very difficult conditions which he met and that, that we were able to, uh, you know, surmount and then we were able to uh, come up with these uh, solutions. So, uh, although there will be uh, difficult times, and I agree with uh, Dr. Saab, whatever he has said, uh, we will be able to, inshallah, surmount these difficulties and uh, the BISP program and all other uh, uh, measures are in place and we will be able to come out of this uh, quagma and inshallah come to a more stable position. Absolutely, inshallah. Of course, that, that is the hope. Thank you very much, Dr. Shazra, for joining us. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mehtab Heather, and thank you, Farah, as always, for thank being you. part of the discussion. We hope there are better days coming for the country. That's all that we have. Have a good weekend. We'll see you Monday.